This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'm going to be talking a bit about a pretty common failure in a lot of electronic devices, particularly older ones, that is pretty cheap and easy to fix, in the hopes to maybe provide a little bit of information on the topic. Right here is a bunch of computer and server power supplies, and there's one thing that they all have in common. They use a lot of capacitors. Inside of these power supplies are a lot of components, and one that's pretty ubiquitous, and also one of the most common components, is the capacitor. Now I'm going to quickly interject here before I continue talking about these power supplies and their internals because I need to warn you now that these capacitors can hold a potentially lethal charge for a while after the unit has been unplugged and powered down. If you do plan to open and service a power supply or other device, like I will be doing in this video, be sure to research how to safely deal with these capacitors and understand that you assume all risks involved with opening and servicing a device. Additionally, altering or replacing anything inside a device could void your warranty and has the potential to cause the device to malfunction. Basically, I'm just trying to say that you should follow and or try anything in this video fully at your own risk and while assuming all responsibility. Stay safe. That warning will probably show up again later in this video, but it's important to make the dangers of messing with these devices clear right out of the gate. All right, back to what I was saying before, these capacitors are in every one of these power supplies and generally there's quite a few of them. So what's special about them? Well, specifically in older devices and especially devices which were manufactured somewhat cheaply, these capacitors are a pretty common cause of failure. The thing is, these capacitors typically cost less than a dollar to replace, and if you have some basic soldering skills, as well as the ability and confidence to ensure that the dangerous capacitors in the units are discharged and safe, it's usually an incredibly easy and cheap repair. Being aware of this and knowing how to do it can save you a reasonable amount of money and allow you to breathe some new life into old devices. I say devices here because capacitor failures don't just happen in power supplies. Pretty much any device with such electrolytic capacitors, like computer monitors, TVs, AV receivers, among many others, are all susceptible to this exact failure. I'm only using power supplies as an example today because being a computer guy, I've seen countless failed ATX power supplies that can be fixed with less than $2 of components and 30 minutes of time. In fact, this power supply, which is the power supply that ran my Optiplex 7010 NAS up until I overhauled it at the beginning of this month, had to have two capacitors replaced. I was performing routine maintenance and cleaning of the system when I opened the power supply to both clean it out and verify its health. It was at this point that I saw two capacitors on the output of the unit that were well on their way to a complete failure. Using some good capacitors off of donor boards though, meaning that I got them for free, I was able to replace them and keep the power supply running for another 7-ish months and it still works today. And with that somewhat long-winded background out of the way, I'm now going to talk a little bit about some basic methods on how to identify a failed capacitor, and then I'm going to perform a capacitor replacement on a server power supply that has a failing capacitor in it. You might be familiar with the terms bulged capacitor and leaking capacitor, but what do those things actually look like? To provide a demonstration, I quickly hooked up a capacitor to my power supply backwards to force a failure. I would also like to note now that these failures mainly pertain to what we call liquid electrolytic capacitors. These are the capacitors that I think most of us are familiar with, and you can see an example on screen right now. There are also some capacitors that can fail in this way that look slightly different, though sometimes these capacitors are actually solid capacitors, and overall, I just haven't observed them failing often, so we're not going to focus on those capacitors right now. But back to the terms I'm demonstrating immediately, as this capacitor fails, you can see some smoke and liquid come out of the top of it. After unhooking the failed capacitor and letting it cool down, you can probably see where both of those terms come from. A bulged capacitor is a capacitor whose top is no longer flat, like the top of this capacitor. On the same note, a leaky capacitor is a capacitor that has started to leak its liquid out, which usually happens on the top of the capacitor. The bulging of this capacitor is caused by excessive heat in the capacitor as it fails. The liquid inside the capacitor expands and sometimes turns into steam, which makes the purposefully weakened top of the capacitor bulge. Most electrolytic capacitors that aren't super tiny have these patterns on their tops, which weaken them so that this happens as they fail. The top will first bulge outward, and after a certain point it should burst open, which will release the pressure inside the capacitor in a more controlled manner, like we saw earlier. This obviously lets some of the capacitor's liquid out too, which is what a leaky capacitor looks like. This is generally considered the most common way that these capacitors fail. 
though it is possible for them to fail differently, and we'll actually get to a first-hand example of this shortly. Before we move on, I would like to touch on explosive failures of capacitors, because they do happen. These failures are pretty rare to observe in any capacitor of a reasonable size though, because of the weakened tops put on them, but on smaller capacitors without this design, occasionally when they fail, they will explode. So make sure that you're also looking out for capacitors that look like this one does. So now that we know what a common failure of such an electrolytic capacitor looks like, it's time to take a look at the power supply that I'll be working on today. These are some 700 150 watt power supplies that came out of my Dell R720 server. I actually bought some 1100 watt units, which I'm going to be using in the server, so these power supplies aren't needed immediately, but I would like to have them available as a backup set. A while ago, I opened them up out of curiosity just to see how they packed 750 watts of power supply into such a small package, but I ended up discovering something concerning when I did this. One of the two main filter capacitors in the units was bulging and would likely completely fail in the near future. It hadn't made the power supply fail yet, but it very possibly could, and so it needed to be fixed. Also, before continuing, if you're looking for how to safely handle a potentially live power supply board, the way that I'm handling the unit in these clips with this repair is absolutely not how it's done. I'm only doing this because I have previously verified that the unit is absolutely safe, and I'm certain I'm not at risk risk here. Here you can see side by side the visibly failing capacitor compared to the one in the other unit that doesn't look to be failing. Interestingly, in these 750 watt units, Dell kind of cheaped out on the capacitors. They used a significant amount of capacitors from the brand Capson, which in general aren't recognized to be some of the highest quality capacitors available. Based on what little of the label on the other power supplies capacitor I can read, it seems like the failing capacitor is also a Capson cap, which is just an interesting observation because in this case it's the cheaper capacitors that are actually failing. Pay attention to what capacitors your devices use, it seems to actually matter. For me, the next step is going to be to remove this old capacitor from the board. After removing the board from the power supply's case with the few screws that held it in, I could access the bottom of the board with all the solder joints. It's really important at this point to be sure that the capacitors are discharged as their direct contacts are now exposed. I located the pins that should correspond to the capacitor and desoldered it from the board with my soldering iron and a cheap solder sucker. These solder suckers are great for this job because they make it easy to remove the old solder from the holes in the board that the new capacitor's legs will have to go through. Do note that sometimes there is some silicone glue holding the capacitor in place on the other side of the board, so break that up if necessary. After a bit, I had my capacitor removed, and interestingly, it was leaking out of one of its legs and had corroded to the point that it fell off. But anyway, with the old capacitor that was in worse than initially expected condition removed, I pulled off the yellow tape and discovered that we're dealing with a 47 microfarad, 500 volt capacitor. That first number is the capacitance of the capacitor, which in the case of pretty much every electrolytic capacitor you'll find in a consumer device will be measured in microfarads. Represented with a lowercase Greek letter that looks very close to a lowercase u, meaning that these units are micro, followed by a capital F indicating farads. The second rating I listed, 500 volts, is the maximum voltage that the capacitor can withstand. When finding a replacement capacitor, going for identical values is oftentimes critical. However, if there is one value that you can take some liberty with, it's the voltage. Though keep in mind, you can only go up from the original voltage value. Never go down, as your capacitor might end up being overvolted and fail because of this. So, a 2200 microfarad, 25 volt capacitor will be absolutely fine to replace a 2200 microfarad, 16 volt capacitor, assuming that it can fit properly. Speaking of fitment, if you're going out and buying a replacement capacitor, there's no excuse to not try to exactly match the dimensions of the original. But, if you have correct value capacitors on hand that are slightly different sized to the original, it's usually fine as long as it doesn't interfere with other components and as long as the capacitor's pins safely reach the holes in the PCB without being excessively exposed or bent in extreme ways. In my case, I don't have any matching value capacitors on hand or on any donor boards, and furthermore, due to how dense this power supply board is, I don't have a millimeter to spare for any dimension of the capacitor. Therefore, knowing that the capacitor measures 47 microfarads and can withstand up to 500 volts, I measured its diameter, height, and roughly measured the distance between its pins. When measuring the height, I also ensured that I didn't accidentally factor in the bulge to any of my measurements. The capacitor was 16 millimeters in diameter, 31 millimeters tall, and had a distance between its pins, also known as pitch, of 7.5 millimeters. And so, I went to a reputable and authorized electronics components reseller to find a suitable replacement capacitor, preferably from a higher quality manufacturer. I found these capacitors manufactured by Rubicon that fit the bill perfectly, and since I'm buying these components from a Rubicon authorized reseller, I'm certain they aren't fakes. Yep, 
Fake capacitors are a thing, which is why I don't buy components for these kinds of applications from eBay or Amazon. They might be fakes and they might fail prematurely. These capacitors were kind of expensive, but I'm okay with that because I'm certain that these capacitors won't fail like the old ones did. I bought two because I want to replace the same 47 microfarad 500 volt capacitor in the other power supply as a preventative measure. A few days later, they'd arrived and I was ready to install the new capacitors. Installing the new capacitor is super easy. Quite literally, plug it into the board Board, solder it in, clip the excess legs, and be done. However, one crucial thing to keep in mind is that since these are electrolytic capacitors, they're incredibly sensitive to being hooked up the right way around. You cannot swap positive and negative, or they will immediately fail. Hooking up positive to negative and negative to positive is exactly how I caused my demo capacitor to fail earlier in the video. Usually, the polarity is marked on the board itself, but take a picture before removing the old capacitor if it means you can be certain you'll install the new one the right way around. With the new capacitor installed, and in my case a little bit of electrical tape placed on one side of it that was pretty close to some solder joints on a PCB module just for some extra protection, I was ready to fully reassemble the unit and test it. I first tested it by just plugging it into mains voltage outside of the server. It didn't explode, and it gave a green status light, which indicates that the power supply is in working order. I then pulled out the server, removed both of the 1100 watt units, and only plugged in this single 750 watt. I booted the server, which went just fine, and made it run its onboard diagnostics to place a bit of load on the unit. With about 250-ish watts going into the unit at the wall, not at all a full load, but surely a reasonable one. It ran beautifully throughout the entire 20 to 30 minutes of testing. Awesome. I'd consider this power supply to be in pretty much working order now. And if you've chosen to try this for yourself, again, all at your own risk, I hope that you've been able to fix your device as well. And hey, if you found doing this kind of stuff interesting and might want to work with PCBs and electronics at this level more, you should check out the sponsor of today's video. PCBWay. PCBWay is a manufacturer of high quality custom parts. They do 3D printing, CNC machining, and more, but as their name would imply, they also make PCBs. If you enjoy this kind of repair and electrical work and want to make and order some PCBs of your own, their high quality services are a great choice. I've used their boards in several of my projects and they've never let me down. Plus, if you want to order a board that will come with components already soldered onto it, they even offer PCB assembly services that use parts from reputable parts resellers, meaning that you can be sure you're using real, high quality capacitors in your designs, so you won't be needing to repair your boards anytime soon. Now, I didn't record the repair of the other power supply because why would I show you the exact same job twice, right? However, after I'd removed the old capacitor, I realized that my decision to buy a second replacement capacitor and perform this replacement on the unit that didn't seem to be failing was actually very smart. Take a look at this capacitor. It looks fine, right? Well, as I've mentioned before, bulging and leaking out of the top of the capacitor is a pretty common way for them to fail, but it is not the only way. Now that it's off of the board, look at this thing. It's blown through the plastic bottom of the capacitor and completely eaten one of its legs. It's just gone. In full honesty, I've never seen a capacitor fail like this, but my goodness is this a bad failure. A convenient little demonstration of bulging and leaking out of the top not being the only ways that capacitors fail. In any case, the power supply is now in a much better state with its new Rubicon capacitor, and it'll make a good backup unit. Now, this video was really intended to bring awareness to capacitor repairs and their simplicity to those who may not know about this yet, but I guess it's also serving a bit of a different purpose right now. If you have some decently old 750 watt power supplies in your R720 servers, and I'd assume other servers for that matter, if you can do it safely and assume the risk Risk, open the units up and give those capacitors a check. They might be on their way out. You may have noticed that in this video, I did not cover my method for ensuring that these power supply boards are safe and that their large capacitors are discharged. And I did this because other people have already discussed this more accurately and better than I will be able to. Before attempting to work on a power supply or other high voltage device, do some research and find out how to do it safely. And once more, if you decide to try anything in this video, you assume all risk and responsibility. Well, that's all that I have to share with you in this video. I hope that you were able to at least enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.